All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we have 22 people online and a room full of people here. It's great. I'm Elizabeth Bergener. I'm a, a, a pizza pulmonologist, and I am part of our MCHRI education committee um, who organizes uh, seminar series. Before I introduce our speakers today, a little plug for our education committee and those of us that are involved. Go to the next one. Um, our upcoming seminars, we have um, um, a talk deciphering the Warburg effect, metabolic reprogramming, uh, genetic dysregulation, and cell differentiation. It'll be on Wednesday, March 8th, uh, which will be a hybrid in person and on Zoom. And then on March 16th, we also have a community engaged research uh, virtual workshop, which um, will be virtual. <laughs> And then we also have the Metabolic Health Center Maternal and Child Health Symposium, um, which again will be in person or virtual, which is on March 2nd, um, which will be a nice lineup of, of speakers. And uh, for our seminar today, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So we have Natalia Gomez Ospina, who's an assistant professor in pediatrics. Um, she received her MD PhD here at Stanford, uh, where she studied novel functions of voltage gated calcium channels. She then completed a dermatology residency in Johns Hopkins and then returned to Stanford for. Uh, training in medical genetics. When Matt Porteous is lab as a postdoc, she began to develop genome editing based strategies with therapy for metabolic disease. And now she leaves her own laboratory where she is developing therapies for genetic disease. Today, as well, with her today is one of her um, research scientists, Pascalina Colella, who um, has been working on um, developing improved HNPC based approaches to treat um, metabolic diseases. That I'll hand it over. Thank you for attending. I'm going to go really fast with the introduction because the one that has the interesting and exciting data is Lena. So these are my disclosures. I get grant support from profit and nonprofit organizations, and I'm a member of um, scientific advisory boards for a couple of companies. So I am a medical geneticist, and I'm interested in diagnosing and treating genetic diseases. Uh, every genetic disease is rare, but as a group, uh, there are a lot of people affected. So if you combine, um, there are about one in 12 people in the United States, 25 million, 100 million in the world. And when you look at the statistics, the majority of these people that can generate this is at children. And a lot of large number of them are going to die very quickly at the age of five. And there are very few FDA approved treatments for genetic diseases. And um, there are, I guess, showing. Okay. So the, the pictures are not showing, but there are different ways to approach disease. And for genetic diseases, what I'm interested in is trying to come up with therapies that are as curative as possible. That's always a high bar, but as definitive as possible. So we're aiming for the therapies that are one time as opposed to things that are expensive and that require chronic administration. Of course, there's, there's about six or 7,000 monogenetic diseases that have been documented so far. We're not working on all of them. The ones that we're interested in um, are these neurodegenerative diseases in children. Um, it's a clinical problem that is sort of the most, that gets to me the most. So you have a child that is healthy for a little while that then starts to lose milestones and relentlessly, relentlessly regress. And there's nothing you can do. Um, and so there are many causes for neurodegeneration in children. They can affect the great matter of why they um, many of some of them are genetic and not all genetic. But when you look at the genetic causes epidemiologically, a lot of the genetic causes are due to these uh, to lifestyle source disorders. And so these are, um, and if you, you know, this is an MCHR seminar, so we all care about children and moms. Uh, but it turns out that uh, lysosomal dysfunction and genes that underlie lysosomal dysfunction are now being. Um, reported to have an implication in adult onset neurodegeneration. So it actually kind of makes sense if you have, so what we're finding is, so the, the most well documented gene of this gene, glucose reversitase, is a lysosomal enzyme. We have two copies of glucose reversitase, each one of us. If you have two that are missing, that are normal, and you get very little of residual activity and you get a disease called Rochet disease. But if you're a carrier and you have sort of half of this efficiency, you are six times more likely to develop Parkinson's disease. And if you have Boucher disease, you're 20 times more likely to develop Parkinson's disease. So it really tells us that there's something about the proper function of lysosomes, and in particular the same that, that, may, that makes, makes some cells neurons susceptible to neurodegeneration. So this matters for children, and it also matters for adults. 
And so what are these isotopes? These are your incinerators, your self incinerators. They're more actually more your like your recycling centers. It, they take everything, all the big macromolecules, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, and et cetera, and they get broken down and recycled into other organelles. And so this is why if you, this, uh, they, they don't work depending on how important that enzyme is or that metabolite, there could be a period of normal development until enough material is stored or enough metabolite is stored to start causing the problems. A function like this is quite fundamental for a lot of cells. And so most of these diseases have multi-systemic and a lot of organ systems are going to be affected. But neurons and glia and the and, and, and the, the nervous system are, because they're engaged in so much cell-cell communication, they're very susceptible to this, to, to, to lysosomal, to having problems when lysosomes don't work. So two-thirds of the diseases have some neurogenic components. So these organelles have within them, they're really bag of enzymes. So they have all kinds of enzymes inside and they have the membrane proteins that allow them to you know, do their job properly, channels to import things and also to the, the, the trafficking happens correctly. So it's a, it's a large mm -hmm. class of diseases, about 50 or 60, depending on the class of them. And so there's something really interesting that happens uh, for lysosomal enzymes, which is they're constantly, about a fraction of these enzymes within the lysosome, they're constantly situated into the extracellular space. They're modified with the sugar residues, and every cell has a minus 6 phosphate receptor. Mm -hmm. And so any cell can pick up free-floating lysosome enzyme. So that means that if you have a cell that expresses enzyme and a cell that can't express the enzyme in their vicinity, they can cross-correct each other. And so it's the property of cross-correction. And what that means for therapy development means like, well, I don't need to get the enzyme to the neuron. I need to get it into the vicinity of the neuron in order for it to be cross-corrected. And so this is a well-studied uh, phenomenon for, for lysosomal enzymes. Um, it is the basis for every therapy that anybody has thought about for lysosomal source diseases. But there are actually other mechanisms that, that are, are, you know, that are under light cost correction that are, go beyond enzyme secretion. So um, it's a very interesting topic. We're not going to talk about it today. So a few lysosomal sources always have therapies. They're all based on this property of cost correction. One is the intravenous infusion of an enzyme. I told you if the enzyme is there, the cells will pick it up. And so, but you can imagine you have to manufacture a recombinant protein to be infused into somebody and it has to be for the rest of their, their lives and it has to be weekly so they come in for weekly infusions that are four to five hours so quite quite a treatment and it doesn't cause the blood brain barrier okay so your neurologic symptoms are not going to improve and so the only way to get it to cross the brain barrier is to actually put it directly to the brain using intrathecal delivery there's one approved therapy that uses intrathecal delivery of recombinant enzyme for the rest of somebody's life uh, to keep them from, you know, uh, decomplicating, I guess. So they, that is therapy, kids that work with ports in their heads so we can inject the enzyme that they need. So mm, not ideal. Another option for some of these therapies is called, it's an allogeneic hematopoietic symptom transplant, meaning a donor bone marrow gets transplanted into the patients. And, you know, we're going to talk about why this works, but and if you get a rare reaction, like why would you do a bone marrow transplant for a neurological disease? That's 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 understandable. Hematopoietic synthetic transplants have been indicated for several of these diseases. Some of them are primarily neurological, some of them have more systemic components. And so we do this in the clinic, and I'll, I'll show you, you know, one disease that we do this um, for. Um, you don't need to read all this, but there's ongoing clinical testing for hematopoiesis and transplant for several diseases. There's a very good proof of principle that they could work. Um, the idea of this table is sort of to overwhelm you with words, just because, just to tell you, there are a lot of possibilities for this kind of transplants to treat disease if we overcome some of the problems that we have. So how do we use the blood to treat them? One of the ways that we know this happens is that cells from the bone marrow can be recruited into the brain to reside as tissue myelin cells. They're microglia like or CNS microglia. So you can replace that compartment cells with the bone marrow. Now, that doesn't happen under normal circumstances. You have to have, you kind of have to force this process. Okay. And so it's a combination of having a bone marrow that's equipped to deliver the thing that you're missing and, and, and pre treating the body in a way that the, the central nervous system is going to recruit from the bone marrow. So, two very important aspects to making hematopoietic central transitions work. For, uh, for this kind of non-hematological indications, the cells and the conditioning regimen. So we don't know much about this. So this is what I was saying. So making a hematopoietic symptoms transplants 
safer and more efficient requires two things. Autologous transplantation approaches. You don't want allogeneic donors has a lot has a lot of you know could have. You may not have a compatible donor to begin with. It takes a while to find one, and if you have a rapidly progressive disease, your kid in, in two months is just nothing to rescue after that. So finding donors, uh, the time that it takes, the complications of inheriting somebody else's immune system can be the graphic disposed of disease. There's a long time to, 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 to modify reconstitution when you get an allogeneic donor. So if you could get your own cells and fix them, you would want to do that. And so we're going to talk about that. And the other thing is modifying the free, so the free transplant condition of brain is that we do before one of these transplants to make it more effective for this non-neurologic communication. So I'm going to talk to you about enabling autologous transplantation. So you've heard about genome editing, you've heard, you know, you probably do it in the lab, but a lot of you maybe are doing it to knock out things. In the lab, we're doing it to repair things. And so a lot of people think of genome editing as a way to take mutation and revert it back to a normal sequence. We're going to be using it to recreate new, uh, new sequence and sort of new expression cassettes that we think have you know, kind of uh, more versatile therapeutic value. And so the idea here is to take the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells, we can do that. We can modify them ex vivo with crispr cas and then we transfuse them back in the location to, to reconstitute the hematopoietic system and get these leaky cells that are going to migrate in the dish to where we need them. So instead of trying to go, so I'm telling you, we're trying to go out for 50 enzymatic patients if we can, or at least have a platform approach that will work for all of them. So that means going after each gene is not suitable. Uh, going after a mutation, each, each, each one of these patients may have a unique, unique mutation. So um, you need more of a platform approach. So we chose to put the cassettes, enzyme expression cassettes into what we call it a safe harbor, a place in the genome that we co-opt for other things. And we chose to use CCR5. CCR5 is a famous gene, um, maybe maybe not, um, where, uh, that um, uh, about 12% of people in the UK, bi UK biobank have deletions in it, so they don't express it. And this gene was characterized because lacking that, this receptor leads to some resistance to HIV infection, at least the most common form of HIV. So you can perfectly not have CCR5, and in fact, you have a certain advantage of not having CCR5. Um, so, so why a safe harbor? So we can actually control the levels of expression in a more, in a, in a more, in a, in a way that, you know, makes more sense for the therapy, and I'll talk, we'll talk about that. It's a single solution, again, to what I told you, every patient with a certain lysosomal like, storage disease might have their own unique mutation. So if you're going to use genome editing, you'd have to start all over again every time you see You don't want to do that. And then um, you can you can engineer coded sequences in a way that, you know, maybe you want to enzyme that you're stable. Maybe you came up an idea to make it possible and very more efficiently. So that gives you the opportunity to actually engineer coded sequences. And it's just so much easier, like, as I mentioned, more adaptable to other LSTs. So the way that we do CRISPR-Cas9 is we use, in hematopoietic stem cells, we use Cas9 delivered as a protein, so it's short, it's for a short amount of time. It's combined with a chemically modified uh, RNA, which is the guide RNA that guides that in place to the, to the target site. Right? That's for, you know, that it's better for hematopoietic stem cells, that's a long story. And then after the, these two create a double-stranded break, and then we need a donor template for repair of a double-stranded break that has homology on the inside of the, of, the, of the break. And we deliver that single stranded DNA as an A genome. So it's complicated, it's crispr cas A. And so um, we have used this system to enable a talk to engineer hematopoietic stem cells for several lysosomal storage disorders. So we've created purple concepts for mucopolysaccharidosis type one from now on and P is one. Gaucher disease, we're working on Crabbe disease and programmable deficiency. But just, I'll tell you a little bit of the story about NPS1, just because we have some interesting uh, developments recently. So this is a lysosomal storage disorder. It's a canonical one. People have been studying this one for a long time. As I mentioned, a lot of organ systems are affected. And the brain uh, is severely affected as well, if you have a severe form. A lot of the symptoms are progress. So just, just read the symptoms. It's just, you know, a lot of things don't work. Like many enzymatic, genetic enzymatic deficiencies, it's not about whether you have it or not have it, it's about how much residual activity you have. So if you have almost zero, you have some very severe form, um, which we call Horler syndrome or severe impacts. If you have a little bit left, you actually have a very different course. You can have a hand on her, right? Um, she can have a pretty normal life. She has a, some, she has one or 2% of residual uh, enzyme. 
So that's enough to prevent the neurodegeneration. We have some cognitive deficiencies, but a very different course in the brain. And that's important to know when you're saying, how much does my therapy need to establish in order to make sure that I'm going to change the clinical course? So we know that we don't have to replace 100% of the enzyme, not even 50%, but maybe if we can get a few percent stably expressed in the brain, we could, do, we could probably change their, their lives. And you say, well, what a weird disease. It's such a rare disease, about 100,000. But every blue state in this map screens every newborn for this disease. So as a society, all of these states have made a commitment to finding these children and delivering the best therapy that you can. We call a family and they have a two-week old and you tell them they have this disease. You better have a good plan for how you're going to manage it, right? No point in calling them if you don't have something to do. So it's an enzymatic deficiency. They're missing this enzyme out of nine days. And when you don't have this enzyme, you can't break this complex of carbohydrates and it's all amino acids. So IDUA is missing, you accumulate gas. So here's an example of, oh my God, I'm missing all, all the graphs. Everything. Um, can I stop share here? <clears throat> Maybe there's a part of my share this. Yes. Wow. So. Okay. Here. So these are a couple of cassettes that you insert. We inserted in human hematopoietic stem cells. PGK, a constitutive promoter, an enzyme, and downstream of it, sometimes we had a fluorescent protein for our mouse studies to track them, isolate them, care track them. For people, we want to use that cassette for that cassette. You can see that. The amount of symptoms with the gift quite the person can say you can see that on the flow plot and you can I as I mentioned I feel the correct. The plot on the left shows you the e e editing efficiency. So if you do the uh, long cassette, about 35% of your um, cells will be edited. So it's not a hundred percent. If you do the smaller cassette, about 50% of your cells will be edited. So it's not a hundred percent, but enough for us to, to think this we couldn't use this for a very and the cells are still have super physiological expression. So if you look there about the cells, we can look at the hematopoietic stem cells, or as I mentioned, we, we really cared about this myeloid image because we think those are the cells that are going to be in the brain. When you examine, you can you can turn those stem cells into those cells by differentiating the nature. And you can measure the enzyme, and they make about 50-fold more enzyme than an animal. So we've improved, presumably improved the therapy by giving them a transplant of their own cells, but also giving them cells that are supercharged. With enzymes, so better able to correct that. And so, one concern about CRISPR in cells is that you can have off target cutting, off target activity. So, one way to assess this is we uh, uh, we use some tools to predict where the guy would be cutting and, uh, and, and sequence deeply on those sites. And we, we couldn't find, so these are different predicted off targets, O2, 3, O2, 14. And uh, the red dots we used a wild type Cas9. The blue dots we used a, a, a high fidelity Cas9 that we developed in with IBT. And you can see that above the limit detection when it's cut that point one, there's really no alternative activity of, of for our for our guy. At least when we do it in a way that is predicted with our guys. And so let's talk about efficacy. How do you show efficacy of human cells? So to do that, we made a model of the disease. That doesn't have an immune system. That's something that we do a lot. So this mouse would enable engraftment of the human cells, and you actually test the human cell. So this mouse has non-detectable IDRNAs, as you can see in the graph, accumulation of gas, bony abnormalities like the people with this disease, some of the physical features of the people with disease. So it's a new model of the disease that enable us to use to test the human cells. And I'm gonna go through this very quickly, but Using the edit the human cells can correct the biochemical uh, defects in the cell. So here, uh, and Matt and Lena were comparing different uh, condition protocols. So the dark, I guess, where is that? Dark red is esulfan, and the lighter one is uh, total body reconstitution. So you can see that there's some reconstitution of enzyme activity with different tissues. And panel B is probably the most intuitive, where you compare the clear dots, which is a healthy mouse, 
the blue dot is MPS1 mouse, which is excreting a ton of this gag into the urine because they don't have a way to break it down. And then you have the resultant treated mouse dark blue, which is almost normal in terms of level. And then the CDI treated, which is much improved, but not monotonic result. And so we've improved the biochemical defects. I'm not going to show you about the behavioral stuff, but this also happens in the brain. And so you can see that if there's some enzyme activity in the brain, maybe 10%, depending on you, which is great. I told you 10% would do a big difference. And you can see that it increases the gag, and you can actually track the human cells by looking at this, these green dots, which are labeled with a human specific marker. So the cells, the human cells are in the brain. It's nice that they actually get recruited to this mouse brain, not, not necessarily intuitive that they would, they would do that. So it improves. So I've shown you, you know, we can edit human hematopoietic stem cells. So think about how that's helpful. It's helpful for a lot of things. We show you that it's efficient enough that you can think about using this. I've shown you that um, that this, at least for MPS1, it's efficacious. It keeps we able to improve the symptoms and the back chemistry readout in these uh, animal models. And uh, I showed you that we don't find we find any targets, but I mentioned that we've done about 200 bios, uh, autopsies on these mice, so the mice that we transplanted. We never found a tumor. Uh, these are gross, gross. And then we, so we did some other assays when we initially published the paper about DNA damage in particular studies. So, so far we've pretty convinced this. So what? Uh, so with that data, we're able to apply to California agency, California Institute of Regional Medicine, to see if they would fund the development of this therapy. Issues. And so we were awarded um, just recently the money to do the IND exercise. So if you're curious, this is what that consists of. So what we need to show the FDA now in order to move this forward is um, show them that, you know, we did this really well in our very messy tissue culture room, <laughs> in our fridge, and my lab is laughing for this. And uh, so now we need to show is that we can do this in a cell manufacturing facility. You know, we need to, you know, we can use the plates we had. We can use the same electric friction machine we have, and then we need to buy reagents that are good manufacturing process. So we have to buy all that again, and we need to redo the process to make sure that we can we get the same energy efficiency, that we're not killing cells within the machine, et cetera, uh, and scale it up so that we actually do, you know, it's not for mouse, it's for a person. So process development and complete three clinical runs. That means buying all the reagents and setting up all the machinery that we need. So expensive. We also, the money is also cheap, actually. So I, you know, I'm, it, you know, I told you why I think this is safe, but FDA thinks that we need to do a few more things. So we needed to do, we're going to do more, more comprehensive and unbiased genotoxicity assay on the edit itself to see if there are any potential off not any off target is not bad, but an off target that, you know, could, you know, you suspect could increase proliferation or um, would not be uh, good, right? So that's the things that we're going to look for. And then we're going to perform a real, what we call a tumor toxicity assay, which is you take a human dose, you split it into a bunch of mice, you follow them for 20 weeks, and then you, you look for tumors everywhere. Not, not like we did sort of by eye, but much specifically. And then you track, you know, what's killing these mice, how are they surviving, et cetera. So a tumor toxicity study of the cells. And then we're going to repeat the efficacy study because the FDA doesn't like that we didn't use the same right of administration that would go in humans. So think about your, your, your experiments when you do them. It has to match the right of administration. So if you if you the patient is going to be IV, do it in the muscle IV. Um, and the other thing is they they do want a proof with the with the product that we made with our process, with our clinical process, not with the process that we have. So we actually have to get the process up so we can actually repeat the other systems and you know do the IND trial. So that's from the autologous part. A big, big problem for opportunity to using cells safely and effective in these non hematological medications if to optimize the transplant condition. So what is this? Conditioning is a treatment that you have to give a patient before you give them a hematopoiesis transplant. If you just infuse hematopoiesis stem cells, they're not going to stick. So we think of it, we don't actually know what it does, but we always say, well, it clears out stem cell issues. So it's like Stem cells sitting on this chair, and you're going to move it out so that new stem cell can go there. I think it's that's what we say, but yeah, that's one thing. And in the automatic setting, is providing a new solution. When you're in, when you're transplanting somebody into cells, you kind of have to kill the the patient's immune system so they're more likely. How it does the brain, we do not know. We know that you know, maybe. Uh, and, and I'm oh, sorry. In this condition, it can be done in different levels of intensity, so really mild to medium to really hard. For, for, for transplants, 
to help in, in neurological diseases, you can only give them a very strong model that you can show. So as strong as possible. If you do, if you do with this, so minimal invasive is not going to work. So which tells us that the chemotherapy that we basically give to the conditioning has to be strong enough, has to cross the bone barrier, and has to act on the CNS to, to cause this recovery. And we think the microglia are very important in that process. So with that, how we're changing, revolutionizing conditioning. You'll see that's good that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. still sharing, right? We had many technical challenges. Um, yeah, when you share your screen, it's um, it's you can so when when not much time left, but I will try to summarize the improvements on the conditioning regimen. And I will probably go past on some slides, but then we hope you will thank the question. So as Natalia said, hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation provides clinical benefit for several neurological disorders because it is the standard of care for several of them. However, the approach still has several limitations. In particular, the low okay, <laughs> the inefficient engraftment of HSPC derived cells to the brain that results in low efficacy, the slow pace and less repopulation kinetics of the cells that migrate from the bone marrow to the brain that is not uh, effective enough in diseases that are fastly progressive and very severe. And finally, the unwanted side effects that are associated to the uh, re requirement of using high dose busulfan conditioning retransplant because it is a, a chemotherapy genotox drug. So we and others exploited the inhibition of the cs one receptor to improve this conditioning uh, arrangement because this receptor is re specifically expressed in microglia macrophages and is required for the survival of Cells. And it is a paratine kinase that is bound by SF1 and IO34 and that has conserved function from fish to humans. Indeed, humans that lack SF1R have a complete genetic ablation of macroglia macrophages. And in knockout mice, SF1 and knockout mice, the transplant of bone marrow cells that here are lumped in green, and this is a study done at Stanford for some time ago. There is a very efficient repopulation of cells that migrate from the bone marrow in the, in the brain, that are the green ones. And this, of course, in absence of any conditioning, because the recruitment is powered by the knockout of CSI1R. Mm -hmm. So, to inhibit CSI1R in our study, we selected a drug that is called Pelexis in 1997, because it is a thinness parent small molecule. It is approved by the FDA for the depletion of tumor associated macrophages and is also in clinical trials for other diseases. And also, after long term administration to patients, as a shown that very mild cell uh, effect. So, it's a promising conditioning drug. But it's important to keep in mind that even after long term administration of the drug to mice, that in this case are reported mice to the express GFP in macroglia macrophages, there is even after the depletion, the interior, you see no macroglia in the brain, there is a very fast repopulation of the cells that is driven by brain resident progenitors without any contribution to the bone marrow. So the drug alone is not enough to um, ensure a stable depletion of the cells. So, but we wanted to test this. So the first experiment that we did, we conditioned what type of uh, uh, we conditioned what type of uh, black six mites with PLX using different regimens at the beginning to optimize the conditioning. And we transplanted them with what type cells expressed in HSP. And the cells were transplanted either IV or uh, ICD. And uh, three months after transplant, 
we found no entrapment of bone marrow donor derived cells, neither in the brain nor in bone marrow, suggesting that the drug alone is not sufficient to condition neither the bone marrow, neither the brain. So what we did is to combine the drug to commonly use malabetic regimens that are in mind, such as busulfan, which is clinically relevant because it's really uh, used in the clinic in the patients, total body radiation and tiosulfan, uh, which is an analog of busulfan, but is not able to control the environment. So we conditioned the mice, then we have found what type of genetic body is set, and then we optimized a regimen that consists in a very short inhibition of the you know, one with the TLX only for the pain. And three months after transplant in the bone marrow, we found that the engraftment of the body itself was comparable when we use TLX in combination with each drug. So TLX with the sulfan, TBI, or sulfan and was comparable to malabrasion alone. So the engraftment in the bone marrow was efficient with and without the drug. But when you look at the brain, we found a significant increase in the engraftment of JP positive cells in the brain when we combine PLX with busulfan or PLX with total body radiation. And this was 15 times, three times more. But the increase, we didn't observe any increase combining PLX with trosulfan because trosulfan doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we really need to condition the brain to achieve this improvement with the drug. And it is like uh, clear by the flow plot. So then we asked if the recruitment of these cells was persistent over time, over time because this was a three month study. So from now on, we only use busulfan because busulfan is clinically relevant as compared to, to DBI. So we conditioned the mice. We again asked with um, what type of the body people model cells, and we uh, applied the initial set one up in the dorsum, and we followed the mice for seven months. And again, we observed 90% engraftment of bone marrow gel cells into the brain, with the very much of their life. And this was a fourth fourth in increase as compared to the sulfan alone, so providing a, a great advantage in terms of engraftment in the brain. And it's important to say that we only see specifically the recruitment of, of um, TD45 positive 11 positive cells, which are microbial like cells, but not the recruitment of other kinds of bone marrow cells, such as lactic positive monocytes, T cells, and B cells, suggesting that there is no main uh, inflammation and, and vast recruitment of bone marrow cells, but very specific recruitment. So this is just a representative histological analysis of the brain and spinal cord of the mice. And as you can see, the, the bone marrow guided cells are distributed in all the brain, and also they can acquire ramified or ramified morphology, and also they uh, colocalize with IGA-1, which is a very well-known uh, marker of myeloid macrobial cells. So, and this is just a zoom, sorry. This is just a zoom to show you that compared to busulfan alone, when we added the drug, there is uh, an important um, uh, increase in the percentage of these positive cells in different regions of the brain. But why we need to use busulfan to allow this recruitment? Because busulfan plays a key role in inducing microglia senescence in the host. This is not achieved when we use the, the drug alone. Then we ask it, which is the gene expression of these cells that uh, engraft in the brain, if they're really similar to macrobi or not. And to do this, we perform a single cell RNA analysis of uh, parts of the CD45 positive, 11 B positive, positive cells from the brain of naive JP positive mice. You yeah. can see the one, the positive mice. And mice, what type mice transplanted with the what type JP positive bone marrow? And condition them with the busulfan fast relax. And we evaluated the JP positive bone marrow cells, os microglia that is JP negative, and C11 positive cells that are uh, engrafted in the bone marrow. And this principal component analysis showed that this is dependent on genetic expression sequence. Indeed, the cells that engraft in the brain of the bone marrow, which are the blue ones, clustered very close to the naive and host microglia as compared to the bone marrow cells. We also did an extended gene expression analysis. And I just will uh, show to you this um, uh, slide that shows that the cells engrafted in the brain, which are the first line aligned in yellow, uh, re express only when engrafted in the brain a microglial -like signature with many genes that are expressed in naive and os microglia, which are the two central lines. 
but the same genes that are very specific in myeloid macronuclear cells are not expressed in the same cells that are engrafted in the bone marrow, suggesting that they acquire a macronuclear phenotype specifically in the, into the brain. And this is just an example of a very high specific marker of macronuclear, which is the M119, which is expressed in the cells engrafted in the brain, but not in the bone marrow, even if there are it is at lower levels as compared to the naive and lost cells. Mm -hmm. And we confirm with other analysis that the cells engrafted in the brain, for the 80% of them, they have an hemostatic gene uh, signature. Then we wanted to confirm that the, addi the addition of PLX to the sulfa did not impact negatively the graft in the bone marrow. So, and the other hematopoietic compartments. And as you can see on the top uh, line, we achieved similar engraftment in the bone marrow using single blue sulfan, the light blue, or blue sulfan plus PLX, which is the dark blue, and it was uh, very close to 100%. So adding PLX does not, has no detrimental effect in engrafting in the bone marrow, and the dependency of cells in this uh, uh, compartment is minimally uh, affected. Also, we found that the combined regimen did not negatively impact the engraftment of macrophages. So we deplete, but then they are perfect, perfectly um, replaced by the donor cells um, in all the tissues, so are the liver, one in the liver new. And also, we wonder if this massive recruitment of homologous cells into the brain could change the neuron behavior of mice. And we, were, we compared uh, mice uh, condition or transplanted condition with sulfam, sulfam PLX, or anti the mice. And we didn't find any significant changes evaluating locomotion, exploratory behavior, spatial memory, and recognition memory. So then we wondered if we can use this combined regimen to achieve a uh, to improve the therapeutic effect of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And to do this, we selected a very uh, well uh, studied uh, disease model in the lab that Natalia talked about, which is Bocopentacoidus type 1, so MPS1. So, uh, as Natalia said, this is a relatively master disease caused by the deficiency of the IBO enzyme. And the most severe form is the other form that has very severe neurological manifestations, the uh, mental delay, and intellectual disability. So the, as I said, the available treatment for MPS1 are allogeneic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is the standard of care for neuropathic MPS1, in which donor-derived cells are transplanted into the patient. And the other uh, approach is enzyme replacement therapy, in which the other enzyme is infused in circulation. But for both therapies, there is limited algo delivery to the CNS, as I explained, and also these therapies, both of them have a very limited efficacy on the neurological manifestation. So we think probably improving the condition, because in the case of allogeneic hematopoietic um, stem cell transplantation, the patients are conditioned with boosted fund alone. This is the standard of care. So maybe combining with PLX, we could achieve better um, therapeutic effect. So to do this, we, we have an immunocompetent mouse model for MPX1 that uh, is there as uh, algal deficiency, so a deficiency for the algal enzyme. So we condition the mice, we transplant it with what type of marrow cells express in GFP. So these are cells that don't overexpress the enzyme, just express what type levels of the enzyme. And when we look at the brain, we, we saw a threefold increase in the engraftment of the bombard derived JT positive cells in the brain, and it's been pretty evident looking at the flow plots. And this also result, resulted in the increase in significant increase in enzyme activity that was about fourfold in the brain, suggesting that this conditioning regimen can improve the efficacy of the therapy for the brain. Then when we look at the hematopoietic compartments, uh, as expected, since we see uh, comparable engraftment in the Compartment, we found similar levels of enzyme in the circulation and similar levels of enzyme in the, in the visceral organ. So the main advantage is uh, as we expected in the brain. Also, we saw um, a more consistent uh, engraftment of macrophages in this uh, uh, mass model that was an uh, increase of 30% when we combine the plus less, and also a better um, correction of organomegalis that we in the kidney and in the spleen. Then finally, I, will, I will try to go fa uh, fast on this part that, so, so far I showed that we 
with this conditioning regimen, we uh, can improve the recruitment. So the fitness, we have more cells in the brain that come from the bone marrow. But what about the kinetics of the population? Because there are some, some diseases that progress very fast, such as Crabbe disease, as Natalia indicated, and they need really prompt intervention, intervention after birth. So lot of cells engrafting in the brain to deliver the missing enzyme, but also very fast. And so far, this process of using only busulfan is slow, as I will show you. So we evaluated the repopulation at early time points after the drug administration. So one, four, eight, and 21 days after the drug was shot. And what we observed is in the black line that is like as expected an efficient depletion of the host microglia and the very fast repopulation in green with cells that derive from the bone marrow. And we reach about 30-50% at only eight days after the uh, drug was shot, and this become 90% at one month um, after transplant that corresponds to three weeks after the drug was shot. And if we if we compare this to busulfan alone, which is the blue line. You can clearly see that the combined conditioning regimen uh, results in superior engraftment in the brain at very early time points after the drug was shot, uh, as early as one day after uh, drug removal, and it peaks at 90% at about one month after transplant. It remains stable at 90% up to uh, seven months after transplant. Then we uh, wanted to check if this combined regimen could result in uh, severe inflammation in the brain because we are recruiting cells from the bone marrow. But lastly, we found no increase in the pro inflammatory cytokines in the brain and very minor changes in the other compartments. And finally, I will really quickly touch the last uh, drawback of the approach that we are still working on it, which is the unwanted genotoxicity. That is, that is strictly inherent in the use of the sulfone because it is escalating chemotherapy. So we try to decrease the doses of the sulfone and we did some experiment in which we use clinical with the sulfone. We up the dose, so instead of 100 mg per kg, we use 50 mg per kg with and with without the labs as comparison and then even lower doses, which are 55 and 20. And we could get engraftment in the bone marrow, which is busulfone dependent as expected, because more busulfone you use more engraftment in the bone marrow you will have. And when we look at the brain, we didn't see the same increase, but we could see that even at low doses of busulfone, we can stabilize the engraftment of bone marrow cells in the brain, and this can be useful for some diseases that uh, in which high doses of busulfone can, cannot be used. And also we could see a clear uh, improvement in the engraftment of the macrophages, so reducing busulfone and other. But finally, as Natalia said, uh, so far I, I just show you the transplant mouse to mouse is in a context can be that can be seen like an analogenic transplant. But what we are uh, focused on is the um, use of autologous cells genome edited, as Natalia explained, for uh, corrected at the CCR5 locus and retransplanted in, into the patient. So also we decided to evaluate if the addition of LX to the busulfan could have a detrimental effect on the engraftment of genomic cells. So to, to make the story short, we conditioned immunocompromised mice with the clinical busulfan, and we uh, edited human stem cells, hematoid stem cells, the CCR locus, expressing a reported YPG. We conditioned the mice with PLX, and we evaluated the engraftment. And we observed comparable engraftment in the bone marrow that was about 60%, comparable multilineage differentiation, uh, fraction of um, white people cells and also the five edited at least, suggesting that there is no detrimental impact. And also, we could clearly see the engraftment of you know, human cells in the brain, which are the green dots that, that you see in the histological uh, analysis. And uh, unfortunately, due to, the due to the limitations of the uh, external transplant model, we cannot appreciate the increase when we use PLX. So, finally, uh, I showed you that uh, combining malabative doses of busulfan with a short course of cetaconary inhibition using PLX-6397, we can get up a very robust and fast repopulation of the brain by bone marrow viral cells that are microglial like so they express microglial like signature, and we can go up to 90% of the uh, micro, the microglial cells that are replaced by bone marrow cells. The engraftment is stable, so from one month after seven months, and 
with this condition in regimen, we preserve the hematopoietic reconstitution, and also we uh, have no apparent side effects. And using this regimen, we can also improve the efficacy of bone marrow transplant in a mass model of MPS1. So we think that we can, um, with this approach, we can improve and widen the application of hematopoietic sensor transplantation for uh, neurometabolic neurological diseases. So finally, I would like to thank my mentor, obviously, Natalia Gomez Spina, the Gomez Spina Lab, Professor Di Valentina, Rui, Edna, Luisa, and Jack, and the me with the uh, studies, uh, our collaborators of Stanford, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful story. What a day there. Great. Um, we do have one question from Dr. Oro. Um, this came in when you were kind of first talking yes. about. Okay, yeah, you saw pop ups. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do you expect the gain of function um, effect from the enzyme? Uh, let's see. Do you expect gain of function over effect in the enzyme overexpression in CNS? This would not be tumors. How does your conditioning affect this possibility? Um, <laughs> <laughs> think about this. Story. Yeah. Closer. Yeah. So I guess that first part, I guess we gotta be close to it. Yeah, because it's talking about gain. So gain of function effects of the enzyme in the CNS. I guess you know how much enzyme gets expressed in the CNS is that. It's a uh, depends on two things: how much enzyme each cell enzyme each cell makes, which we know our cells are fifty-fold, and how many cells you actually get in the brain. So before Lena got this to work, we could only rely with a few percent of cells in the brain. So we know that the we could only partially reconstitute, you know, the the enzymatic activity in the brain to a few percent of normal. So we we know that per cell basis, there's no effect of it overexpression. Um, yeah. So now, what would happen if we, if we replace ninety percent of the mitochondria with fifty fold IDUA? Um, I don't know. <laughs> there are the experiments with the lenti. People have tried this with lentivirus, and the the, the, the lentiviruses were making um, like three hundred fold more enzymes because they had like eight iterations or something like that. Uh, and those mice didn't have any problems either. Um, but good. Now, let me make sure. Okay, I have a question regarding that. I'm also curious if you can talk about using the spread of the time. Are you using any version of the version from the sign? Are you using a macrophage like or a microglia like promoter? That's a great point. So, for, for iduronidase, it, it depends. That's the answer. For iduronidase, we use a constitutive promoter because there, there was enough evidence that the cells would tolerate overexpression. And, you know, if you overexpress, then you can sort of be a little bit less worried about how many cells in graft, how many cells you edit, because there's, there's room there. So uh, that has a strong constitutive promoter, is a human PGK promoter that's used, it's been used in gene therapy trials before. For other enzymes where we've learned the hard way that you couldn't just overexpress it in the hematopoietic compartment, we have to just restrict the expression to the lineage that we care is the most effective, which we think is the monocyte macrophage lineage. So that's involved the design of, we've designed Lina has two, you know, we have two different monocyte macrophage specific promoters that allows us to have it in the cells that we want, but not in the cells that we don't want. Um, so that creates a kind of a different calculation when you're talking about like how, how many fold per cell, how many total cells, et cetera. And we're using that for glucoserinocytis and Gaucher, and we're using that for galactoserinocytis and Crabbe. Long answer. Um, Jesse Alexander with stem cell transplant. Um, I'm just interested in some of the surgically is a lot of such a different and what sort of especially early process pain you may see with that. But I was curious about studying especially liver toxic leave, like things that will be the syndrome. Um yeah, your you mean liver split that uh, like busulfan specific toxicities or other I mean, I mean the high risk certainly and the agent but I'm not yeah familiar. yeah yeah they come you want to recap so that people can so so some excellent questions about like uh potential you know toxicities of a combination regimen right with this new drug 
So we start, we chose to go with this, with this, with this drug that is FDA approved. It's FDA approved for the CSF1 R data function tenosynovial tumors. So patients take it for a long time. And you know, it's crossing the problem barrier. You know, I would love to know, like, you know, study those those patients to see what kind of, but you know, they take it chronically, they do experience, they make this it, it's they experience fatigue and I guess uh, brain where it's like one side of it, but it, it's all really mild for you know a cancer therapy. And um and so we've done we haven't done like chemistries or like serum chemistries or more specific studies of, of toxicity, but I think if we wanted to move forward with this combination, I would propose to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But the drug alone is pretty safe. Even in the mice, you could put the mice on it for in the in the in the chow for months. And you, you'll see that the bacteria are gone, and then you take it off three days and minor they come back. But again, you never know what happens when you combine them both. But at least in our studies, the mice are not behaving. So um, amazing work, first of all. Thank you. Really nice to see for so many failures we have in the lab. When it works out so beautifully, it's a beautiful. Um, two questions is, uh, regarding uh, uh, the engrafted cells and their distribution in the CMS. Uh, is there any particular uh, um, uh, variability that you have seen? Uh, Can I talk about that? I'll let you take some questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, we, there are quite a bit in all the lines of this uh, preference in the, because it's so efficient and they really are. And the depletion of the Londoners is also very easy, and so all the issues are very efficient in the population. But with the fact which we cannot use other usual funds, we do because it's leader, we do the same uses. And also the cells are in a context in which they don't have the human side effects to, to make the job. Basically, there are some favorite areas which are which is the part. This is only the observation of the cell transplant system, which is not easy. For several, for several reasons. And, and I'm saying no. I mean, what is the FDA asking you for as far as uh, regulation of enzyme activities? Uh, if you, you're showing us that you know a minimal increase really has significant clinical impact, so we uh, need that much um, to to get to the clinical. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but you know they don't have a specific comment on that. As long as you show that it's safe and effective, they're happy with you trying it. That's, to us, the best readout is our cells and grafting. If it's not, again, it's always kind of a, comp, a, a calculation that involves the, the total engraftment, right? Like, um, so so let's say the percentage of efficiency. So we know that it's not going to be 100. percent If I knew it was kind of 100 percent edited, and maybe you know. Um, then I would be, and then 100% engrafted, then I'm like, oh, maybe we need less this time. But I'm sort of counting on this superficial article to compensate for, uh, we know that the edited cells don't engraft as well as an edited cell. So when you, when you, let's say you start with a product that has 60% edited cell, the bone marrow will not be 60% edited. It'll be about 30% edited. So you'll count with a drop on that. So if I think, if, if the cell's tolerated, um, I, I rather use it and, and engage every if it's constitutive, then you also engage every lineage in making your enzyme. But you're right, it, it may not is we've already know that it's not a solution for it's not the right solution for every enzyme right. because they're not all tolerated that way. Okay, question online mm -hmm. um, from Matt Dougal. How long will it take for the autologous product to be edited and ready for transplant? And mm -hmm. would this timeline limit the types of diseases that can be treated this way? So I think he means no. once it's already approved. Like what's the time? For yeah, that? so I mean, so the the, the cell manufacturing takes uh, five days. Oh, yeah, it's quick. it's quick. Yeah, we don't want to keep the cells in culture for very long because they lose the stem cell potential. So, but then if if you add to it, remember for this particular disease, they're going to get an allergen. So the only thing that's going to be different different is that five days of manufacturing, four days of manufacturing. They will have to have you know several days of uh, mobilization, which you know could be about, you know three, four, whatever. And but but the manufacturing is actually not that long. 
as opposed to maybe trying to use iPSCs, that's my argument, for using iPSC, IPSC derived cells for the brain. It's like, that just takes a long time. Also on the question of timeline, how long do you think it's gonna take from now to get through all those things to get it to take? We have two years to have an ID file. So okay. I'm not joking about your, 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 your timeline. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> that sounds best. Yeah. Is there maybe one more in the back? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you also have other clinical implications or restoring the KDO of the E1 gene in the CNS. Like, with this, just look down the disease, so it also able to measure it and say that the density is the same. I'm saying that we should stop. Uh, okay, so, I mean, we know that an allogeneic transplant, if done early, this is why we look for the newborns, right? Could really sort of stabilize it, so so you could, um, but it's not perfect. I think these kids are not cognitively normal. We just we get very few cells in the brain to like do it, and they're 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 wild type levels, so even less. So so, but again, that the question of how perfect their their brain function is going to be, it's how good your treatment is. So, but how early you catch them. So the beautiful, the opportunity that we have with PS1 is we, it's, it's screened for in, in, in which we also makes it harder because it's in. And there's a thing called lengthy viral, yeah. lengthy viral gene transfer using the virus that says, and this one, mice, and humans. And then this one, humans, that shows that you, you can. The, yeah, the data looks like the, the development is, almost normal oh, you never know like when you actually see the patient you're like well that's not normal but yeah way better than dying by in your okay. teens for sure yeah. and achieving milestones all right we'll close with that but thank you so much everyone for coming for our in-person seminar.